The old building had the remains of a tower, an indistinguishable mass of mason work, overgrown with ivy, and the shells of walls attached to this were half filled up with soil. I had never examined it closely, I am ashamed to say. There was a large room, or what had been a large room, with the lower part of the windows still existing. On the principal floor and underneath other windows, which were perfect, though half filled up with fallen soil, and waving with a wild growth of brambles and chance growths of all kinds. This was the oldest part of all. At a little distance were some very commonplace and disjointed fragments of building, one of them suggesting a certain pathos by its very commonness and the complete wreck which it showed. This was the end of a low gable, a bit of gray wall, all encrusted with lichens, in which was a common doorway, probably had been a servant's entrance, a back door or opening into what are called the offices in Scotland. No offices remained to be entered. Pantry and kitchen had all been swept out of being. But there stood the doorway, open and vacant, free to all the winds, to the rabbits and every wild creature. It struck my eye, the first time I went to Brentwood like a melancholy comment upon a life that was over, a door that led to nothing, closed once perhaps with anxious care, bolted and guarded, now void of any meaning. It impressed me, I remember, from the first, so perhaps it may be said that my mind was prepared to attach to it an importance which nothing justified. The summer was a very happy period of repose for us all. The warmth of Indian suns was still in our veins. It seemed to us that we could never have enough of the greenness, the dewiness, the freshness of the northern landscape. Even its mists were pleasant to us taking all the fever out of us and pouring in vigor and refreshment. In autumn, we followed the fashion of the time and went away for change, which we did not in the least require. It was when the family had settled down for the winter, when the days were short and dark and the rigorous rain of frost upon us, that the incidents occurred which alone could justify me in intruding upon the world my private affairs. These incidents were, however, of so curious a character that I hope my inevitable references to my own family and pressing personal interests will meet with a general pardon. I was absent in London when these events began. In London, an old Indian plunges back into the interests with which all his previous life has been associated and meets old friends at every step. I had been circulating among some half a dozen of these, enjoying the return to my former life in shadow, though I had been so thankful in substance to throw it aside and had missed some of my home letters, what with going down from Friday to Monday to old Benbow's place in the country, and stopping on the way back to dine and sleep at cellars, and to take a look into Cross's stables, which occupied another day. It is never safe to miss one's letters. In this transitory life, as the prayer book says, how can one ever be certain what is going to happen? All was well at home. I knew exactly, I thought, what they would have to say to me. The weather has been so fine that Roland has not once gone by train, and he enjoys the ride beyond anything. But bring us so-and-so and so-and-so, a list as long as my arm. Dear girls and dearer mother, I would not for the world have forgotten their commissions or lost their little letters for all the Benbows and crosses in the world. But I was confident in my home comfort and peacefulness. When I got back to my club, however, three of four letters were lying for me, upon some of which I noticed the immediate urgent which old-fashioned people and anxious people still believe will influence the post office and quicken the speed of the mails. I was about to open one of these when the club porter brought me two telegrams, one of which he said had arrived the night before, 
I opened, as was to be expected, the last first, and this was what I read. Why don't you come or answer? For God's sakes, come! He is much worse. This was a thunderbolt to fall upon a man's head who had only one son, and he the light of his eyes. The other telegram, which I opened with hands trembling so much that I lost time by my haste, was too much the same purport. No better. Doctor afraid of brain fever. Calls for you day and night. Let nothing detain you. The first thing I did was up the timetables to see if there was any way of getting off sooner than by the night train. Though I knew well enough, there was not. And then I read the letters, which furnished, alas, too clearly all the details. They told me that the boy had been pale for some time, with a scared look. His mother had noticed it before I left home, but would not say anything to alarm me. This look had increased day by day, and soon it was observed that Roland came home at a wild gallop through the park, his pony panting and in foam, himself as white as a sheet. But with the perspiration streaming from his forehead, for a long time he had resisted all questioning, but at length had developed such strange changes of mood, showing a reluctance to go to school. A desire to be fetched in the carriage at night, which was a ridiculous piece of luxury, an unwillingness to go out into the grounds, and nervous start at every sound that his mother had insisted upon an explanation. Do not forget to leave a like and subscribe if you have enjoyed this video. And if you already have, thank you very much. La, la.